standing. If you get can get seated, we'll start on time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, this is the panel on U.S. foreign policy, America first with a question mark. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to welcome all of you, the speakers at this panel, as well as the audience. You brought us a very beautiful day. Unfortunately, tomorrow, I think that we are faced with the prospect of a blizzard. <laughs> and no kidding. <laughs> uh, this is Colorado weather. Uh, I would be very brief in introducing the panelists because you can find their full bio at the end of the program. Uh, so I'll be very brief. Uh, we will start off with Bob Dreyfus, who is an independent investigative reporter who has written extensively and contributed to a variety of media fora. Uh, then there's Heather Herbert, who has been here on previous occasions. Uh, she's the director of the New Models of Policy Change Initiatives, and she has expertise not only in the private education sector, but also in the public sector, having worked in the Clinton administration, both in the White House and the State Department. Sitting next to her is Robert Kaufman, who is a political scientist, uh, a fellow traveler like me, uh, who is a professor at uh, Pepperdine University. Uh, professor Kaufman is a prolific writer who has published extensively on foreign policy, the author of four books. And finally, we have our distinguished colleague, again, a political scientist, Henry Now from the George Washington University. Henry is as I say, another political scientist uh, who is very well known in the area of foreign policy analysis, and he has also worked in the government of the United States, serving it on the National Security Council of the Reagan administration. I myself am local. My name is Steve Chan. I'm the college professor of distinction at CU. I've been here for a long, long time, longer than I care to confess, uh, since 1984, uh, I'm a political scientist. What I propose to do is to have each speaker take maybe five minutes uh, to have their presentation. And then after each of the four has spoken, we will have another five minutes for each person to respond to each other's remarks. After that, a, to a total of, if my math is correct, uh, four multiplied by five, two times is uh, 40 minutes, right? 20 minutes plus 20 minutes. Then we will open up for audience. Uh, we welcome your questions. I have the computer in front of me in case my device is not working or in case you don't have any electronic means of communicating with me. There are people around collecting index cards, okay? So we're, you're welcome to ask questions and I want to make sure that you, we will have at least 25 to 30 minutes for you to ask questions. Okay, without further ado, Bob, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. It's so great to see a room so packed with people who care about foreign policy. That's, that's really encouraging for, for me and for other people who deal with this area, which tends in politics to get you know short shrift sometimes. Um, I, uh, those who, who've heard me in the past or in other conferences know that I'm very measured and judicious in, in what I say. <laughs> um, but um, so we have to think like, what did Trump get right about America first and foreign policy and so forth? And um, I mean, I guess you could say like a stopped clock is right twice a day. <laughs> um, um, maybe in Trump's case, it's like one and a half times a day. He's um, but if you, I'm not sure I know what America first means. What the, what the, I mean, I know various people have various ideas about what it means, but I'm not sure that I know what it, what it means. But I'll tell you who doesn't know what it means. Donald Trump has no idea what he's talking about when he talks about America first or any of the issues that he's managed to stumble into and, uh, and mess up in the past two years and, and two months. Um, if I had to make an analogy about his foreign policy views vis-a-vis -vis America first, I would say it's like tossing a flashbang grenade into a rehearsal of the New York Philharmonic. 
and then watching everybody duck and scatter and scream and run for the exits and so forth. That, that's the way he's basically approached the entire world, allies and adversaries, friends and enemies, frenemies, people who don't pay much attention to everyone is like scratching their head and counting down and hoping that everyone in this room shows him the exit in, you know, whatever it is, 19 months from now. Um, but I'm going to try to sort out what I think he means and then talk a little bit about other versions of that notion. I think what he means by it is some vague notion of America as a military superpower, as a vast colossus of arms striding across the globe, showing everybody who's boss and winning and not losing, right? Um, second, there's an element of isolationism, like, um, and, and you think those are contradictions, but they're really not, especially in this day of, of being able to project military power without sending vast land armies. But he's an isolationist in the sense that he cares only about, let's give him credit for something, I don't know, maybe he cares about the United States more than he cares about um, Montenegro or something. Um, and then, of course, there's economic war, trade and tariffs and all that stuff, which is also his version of winning overlaid with some notion of building real estate resorts on the North Korean coast or something. Um, and then a kind of go it alone philosophy, right? Like, we don't need allies, we don't need friends, we don't need, we don't need nobody. We can just do all this stuff um, ourselves. Um, let me just say that this is a combination of ignorance and arrogance, and that's the worst combination you can have. And we've seen that before with the Bush administration when we had a president who was both ignorant and arrogant and stumbled into a war that left a million people dead for no good reason at all. Um, um, Trump, well, so far he hasn't done that. Um, he hasn't stumbled into any wars. Um, and I guess that's the best thing we could say about um, his, his policy so far. But weirdly, it's not that much of a break what he's doing with what many of the establishment Democrats, both in the Clinton and the Obama administrations, did in approaching th the world. The, the, the notion that we need this vast military that's bigger than the 10 nations that come after us is something that um, the, the, the Democrats have supported all along. Um, Trump just declared the Iranian National Revolutionary National Guard as um, a terrorist organization, a dangerous and absurd decision, but it was one that was supported 12 years ago by both Senator Obama and Senator Clinton when there was a bill to do that um, in the U.S. Senate. Um, there's a there's a lot of things about unilateral wars, whether it was the Clinton administration in the Balkans, the Bush administration in Libya, or the Obama, in, uh, I'm sorry, in Iraq, or the Obama administration vis-a-vis -vis Libya, um, that were some version of criminal aggression or improper behavior, let's put it that way, by the American military. Um, so far, Trump hasn't done that. And it's interesting to me that when he does say, I want to pull my troops out of Syria, that a lot of Democrats suddenly found Mad Dog Mattis to be a heroic figure in the, in the American military and started complaining, why are we, we can't pull out of Syria, that's outrageous. Now I get it, Trump didn't think this through, okay. The same thing when he says we need to get out of Afghanistan. Well, we sure do need to get out of Afghanistan. And I wish the Democrats that are running for president would all collectively say so. It's time to end these endless wars. It's time to shut down our drone wars. It's time to shut down the global war on terrorism. Um, so in a way, I don't think the Democrats have sorted out yet their reaction to Trump's kind of bumbling mismanagement of foreign policy and sorted and, and started to think about 
okay, what do we do instead? What is the progressive vision that we put forward that gives Americans who, who cry when the national anthem is sung, what vision do we give them about what America needs to stand for? Um, and it certainly isn't immigrant bashing and Muslim bans and trashing our allies. So that's, uh, that's where I'll start and then we can move on from there. Thanks. Thank you. Heather? Thanks. Well, just it's, uh, it's great to be back here and great to be back with this chairman. And um, one thing I think all four of us probably agree, we all probably all walk around and say, oh, people should talk more about foreign policy. So it's really terrific to have this big audience on that, on that topic. Um, just to mix things up a little bit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by disagreeing with Bob. And I actually think it's very important to give this administration credit for having a coherent worldview which it is seeking to advance. And I also think um, if you want to get to the place where you ended of thinking about what comes next and what is an alternative, it's important to think about sort of how are they doing at their own objectives. And I actually think they are not doing terribly at their own objectives, uh, which I would also, no surprise, argue are quite different from the foreign policy that has preceded them. And I'll name sort of three. And one is shifting how the U.S. behaves in the world from an institutional foundation to a transactional foundation. Second is moving from a norms-based approach to the world to a personality-based approach to the world. And third is attacking the really foundational notion of Americanness, which the U.S. sort of marketed to the world as a product and with which we reaped an enormous amount of goodwill, which we then leveraged to pursue our interests. So by those three standards, this administration is doing real well according to its, its own goals. And so the first point I want to make is the administration is very systematically breaking down global expectations of a United States that acts predictably and whose interests are relatively unchanging over time and whose interests can be expressed through treaties and agreements and through making small sacrifices for the, where the short-term good of others produces the long-term good of the United States. Now, you notice I'm not saying these are wonderfully moral decisions or wonderfully consistent decisions or that they're undertaken for the good of the whole planet. But the post-World War II order had as a set of its features a set of rules and a set of ways that the U.S. behaved and things that we wanted that we pretty reliably wanted. And you could pretty reliably predict what we would do in various situations, whether you liked it or not. Um, and this administration and the notion of America First is very explicitly breaking that down and replacing it with a U.S. that is unpredictable and seeking at every single moment to maximize its own interests in the particular moment rather than looking to the medium or long term. And I think it's really crucially important to have this conversation more broadly than, than either just military, just economic, just political. So that the example I'll use here is the idea of having trade talks with China where you get China to make concessions, but you make sure you front load all those concessions so the Chinese buy all the goods before the 2020 elections. That's a very transactional worldview. Um, second point, uh, this administration has been quite successful at breaking down the image of the United States that even when the U.S. was out there not following rule, international rules and norms, saw international rules and norms as useful to have and express support for around the world. Um, and this administration has, has really done quite a lot in, in two years to replace that expectation of U.S. support for a rules-based order, even where you knew that the U.S. was pretty cynical about some aspects of it, replacing that with a U.S. that values individual leadership and personal, personal relationships and the exigencies of the moment over systems and personal authority over norms. So exporting to our international affairs the same kind of behavior that you see at home oh, I don't like that guy, or I don't like that woman because she keeps reminding me about the Constitution, therefore I'm going to fire her and replace her with someone else who won't remind me about the Constitution. Um, third, and one that's a little harder to talk about, it's a little less concrete in how we think about international affairs, is really breaking down the image of an inclusive Americanness, sort of brand America that we sold overseas um, since really World War I as a place where immigrants of diverse origins could thrive, contribute, and belong. A, a myth of America, which while it hasn't always been true, has, has been just an enormous source of American popularity, 
fondness for America, willing to endure the presence of American troops, the negotiation of agreements that were partial to America, American leadership in multilateral fora, et cetera, et cetera. And the very explicit effort underway to replace that mm -hmm. with an international image of an America which has a preeminent white and masculinist culture, which immigrants and minorities may be tolerated in, but they may not shift it. American culture can't grow and change, and some immigrants and some minorities may never be accepted in. So then, just as a final question, there's also the sort of um, fact base, is this making the US safer and more prosperous? And here I'll sort of revert to what you expect of me as one of the liberals on the panel and say that even by Trump's own terms, North Korea has more weapons and more launchers than it did in 2016. Nuclear armed India and Pakistan just fought a very scary skirmish. China is um, arming and um, building up the sophistication of its military rapidly. Russia is more heavily dug into Ukraine and Syria than it was in 2016. It's now got a nice little presence in Venezuela that it didn't have two years ago. Um, trade disruptions are harming specific sectors of our economy. They're hastening the movement of some agribusiness and the auto industry out of the United States altogether. And we've seen major spikes in white supremacist violence in the US globally and the emergence of a global white supremacist network. So therefore, I would argue on net, even by the administration is successfully doing the things it says it wants to do, but even by its own standards, they're not making us safer. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> Robert, Robert, you have the floor. I agree with Heather that there is a coherent worldview I also agree that, that President Trump, unlike a Reagan or an Obama, uh, is a more transactional person, using that term uh, in the business world uh, ter sense of the term. Uh, Reagan and uh, Obama had very coherent world views. Uh, Trump has uh, instincts, but I do think those instincts have been translated by Trump and by some of his national security people. I think in my view and, and many others, uh, like Senator Pete Wilson of California, uh, first rate right on defense, he really, after some initial missteps, has compiled an extraordinary national security team. I'll be autobiographical. I was not initially for Trump. Um, I was a Marco Rubio person. Uh, as late as uh, September of 2016, I wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal uh, entitled, What's a Reagan Conservative to Do? That's who I am, and I am still. And I uh, left the question open for the election of 2016. I ended up voting for Trump, and my turning point, presenting my fourth book at Stanford to Victor Davis Hanson on Obama's dangerous doctrine, uh, was the fellow sitting next to me who said, I really like what you have to say, I really like the book, and um, I've liked what you've written. I hope we can talk. My name's James Mattis. And I said, hmm, am I better off taking a gamble on Trump and Mattis or Hillary Clinton, whom I considered likely to be Obama's disastrous third term domestically and internationally? I took a gamble on Trump, and um, with some reservations uh, and caveats, I'm very glad I did. One, uh, I was worried at the beginning that when Trump used the term America first, uh, he meant to draw some linkage between his view of the world and Charles Lindbergh's America first and that notorious group that wanted to keep us out of the Second World War. It's not that at all. One, Trump is not an isolationist. Uh, two, uh, President Trump's foreign policy rests on the following, I think, very coherent premises that have a lot of merit to it. One, unlike his predecessor, and I'm using Jim Mattis's 2018 National Security Statement, which I think is a model of strategic and moral clarity, and which the Trump administration after a rocky start has largely followed. One, unlike Obama, that who never named traditional geopolitical great power threats, as the dominant concern. If you look at Obama's 2010 and 2015 statement, global warming, failed states, nuclear proliferation per se. 
no mention of great power conflict. Trump has it right. China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, four dangerous revisionist powers that are autocratic, increasingly repressive, in the most geopolitically dangerous regions of the world are the most dangerous threats. Premise one. Premise two, and he's largely followed up on this, Trump believes, so do I, so do a lot of people, that uh, we did not spend enough on the military in the previous eight years before Trump became president. To the contrary, the United States military experienced the largest build down between 2010 and 2015 since the Korean War built down. Uh, GDP on defense dropped from 4.7 to 3.3. Defense spending fell in real terms from 736 billion to under 600 billion while the Russians and the Chinese armed prodigiously, eroding the degree of military preponderance on which the credibility of our alliance system depended. Trump has reversed that. Thirdly, Trump emphasizes, I think rightly, that national interests should be the foundation of how a state conducts its foreign policy. In that sense, Trump isn't ignorant. He's going back to the wisdom of the founding fathers. Go back to the farewell address. Rational, enlightened self-interest is not only legitimate, it would be a derelict of the president's duty not to follow that. Fourthly, Trump believes that national sovereignty rather than multilateral institutions have to be the foundation of any international political system. Multilateral institutions, collective security, they don't work. The United Nations is a triumph of hope over experience. Trump recognizes that. Fifthly, Trump understands, and he's right to say, that the bargain we negotiated after World War II, which is wise, which was wise, which works, needs revision. NATO is not pulling its fair share. There is no reason why West Germany is spending only 1.23% of its GDP on defense. And President Trump is, pre is not anti-NATO, but is pressuring NATO allies to do more. One minute, uh, please. And in the Middle East, President Trump has restored strategic and moral clarity to the feckless policy of engagement by A, ripping up a dangerous Iran deal that was Prozac, and B, and I thank him for it, treating a decent democratic Israel as an ally rather than an adversary. So all in all, are we better off than we were when Trump took office? Yes. That's why I'm writing a book about it, and that's why next time I'll be wearing a Donald Trump button rather than reluctantly voting for Donald Trump. Thank you. Thank you. Henry, you are on. Well, thank you. I always just want to say I have nothing to add after I listen to Bob. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to put this a little bit uh, differently and pick up actually on Bob's reference back to the farewell address. I think we have, I want to make the case at least, that America has been first politically since its origins. And what I mean by that are three things, and I'll uh, develop those three things very briefly. First, we were the first, I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, okay, good. I'm going to be arguing that we've been America first politically since the beginning of our republic. And I don't mean by this, by the way, American exceptionalism or anything unusual about the American people. I mean something about what we were doing historically, what we were trying to do historically. Uh, at the beginning, we were the first country to try to create a Republican government and to do it without a monarch and without a state church. It was a huge leap in the dark. That's what Disraeli called it a century later, and he was exactly right. Um, we had, even, we had very little common history when we started this, uh, in the sense that the colonies had related directly to England rather than to one another during the colonial period. So we put together this government, which was designed to uh, protect individual rights and make it difficult to make central decisions, a weak or a limited central government. And we were going to do that with no glue. And we did it. It's remarkable. I wish we could kind of convey that notion more to the American people today. For a century, 
through bitter contests and ultimately a horrible civil war, we worked with this idea of how to make a republic work uh, in which we uh, have a Bill of Rights and we have divided institutions, but not much else going for us. Um, by the way, if this country succeeded, every monarch in Europe knew they were doomed. And there are a wonderful set of comments by monarchs and by their uh, statespeople, like, for example, Metternich uh, of Austria, throughout the 19th century saying just that. If this country succeeds, our dynasties are doomed. So we were doing something which the world had never seen before. It almost failed many times, uh, especially at the time of the Civil War, but it, it worked. Now, by the 19th century, and this is my second point, I mean, by the uh, uh, 20th century, by 1900, our power had caught up with our purpose. We were now a great power. We emerged as a great power in 1900. And for the next century, for the 20th century, essentially, we served an America first purpose in terms of salvaging republicanism in the world three times, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War. Uh, republicanism in Europe was going away. It was the lights were going out in Europe, as Churchill said in 1940. Uh, and they went out to some extent already in 1914. Um, and they w threatened, obviously, to go out again in the Cold War. The United States became that country that helped Europe turn back these monstrous threats to the free society, the free republic of the sort that we had created in America. And that was also now evolving in a few of the European countries, clearly in uh, Britain, for example, and in uh, Holland. Um, after World War II, we, we made a major investment in reconstructing the world in terms of republicanism. We made a major effort to uh, nurture democracy in both Germany and Japan. We succeeded beyond our imaginations, not only in those two countries, we didn't do it, by the way, but we helped to nurture it. That's what we wanted to see happen, and in fact, it did happen. And it happened in a whole string of other countries, all right, after Germany and Japan, including countries like Greece and Spain and Portugal in the context of NATO. Um, by the time the Cold War ended, in the 80s and 90s, something like 60 countries in the world turned democratic, some of them weak and fragile. But nevertheless, it's a remarkable story of the 20th century. I don't think you can tell that story without saying America first in terms of being there to take the lead uh, and to salvage One this notion minute. of republicanism. The One third point, minute. am I over time? I'm sorry. Uh, third point is simply that Trump is now, and, and this is where Trump becomes relevant, we're at the stage where um, we can't do it anymore in the manner in which we have done it before. 21st century is gonna be different than the 20th century. We don't have the capacity to do it. We asked an awful lot of the American people, and especially the American worker, to create that world that improved the prospects of democracy around the world. So we need to say to the allies, either you're gonna step up and help us preserve this world, or it's going to crumble. And we can no longer bear that burden alone. I think Trump's very much in that tradition. He doesn't want to uh, police the world. Uh, and he is struggling to find a way to shake up the allies. Believe me, you've got to break some China if you're going to do that, and he's pretty good at breaking China. Um, and um, he, I think, is succeeding. He's getting their attention. They're spending more on defense. Uh, he is preserving the free world. I mean, all this business about him cuddling up the Russia and China, I mean, this is just nonsense. I mean, he has laid down the gauntlet, so to speak, with Russia in the Balkan, and the Baltic states, in Ukraine. He got us into a fight with Russian forces in Syria. We killed something like 200 uh, Russian troops in that, in that, in that scramble in Syria. Uh, he's, he's not in any way caving into authoritarianism. Now, he isn't a man like the one I worked for who believes in the shining city on the hill, that first America back in the 18th century that I described, doing something that no other country had ever. But he's not too far. If you listen to some of his speeches, the national strategy, that Bob mentioned at his speech in Poland in 2017. He, he relates to American values. It's just not in the same way that the man I worked for did, and most of us would, 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 would prefer, quite frankly. Uh, so I don't, I, I conclude with just the notion that I don't think Trump is acting outside a tradition or an historical experience that America has had as sort of America first. Thank you very much. We ran a little bit over time, <laughs> but I, Thank you.
Uh, we ran a little bit over time, but I would like to give the panelists each uh, a chance to expand on their own remarks or to respond to the remarks of others. If you would limit yourself to five minutes, no more, then or we would allow, yeah, or less. That would be very much appreciated. That would give the audience a chance to ask their questions. Thank you. Let's start with you, Bob. Um, you know, anybody who's covered Trump, anybody who's watched him, reporters who followed the White House and so forth, um, don't see anything like um, a coherent, sensible approach to dealing with either domestic or foreign policy. He's mercurial, he, he lashes out, he, I mean, so I, I completely reject the notion that, that he has anything um, other than a, a, a personality-driven um, and somewhat, you know, mentally challenged view of how to deal with both foreign and domestic policy. Um, but beyond that, I, I want to challenge something about what does America stand for? I mean, I raised the question about the Democratic candidates in 2020. Um, if we cannot collectively, as, as Americans, put forward a vision of what America actually wants to stand for, um, then we can't challenge the Trump re-election on any serious basis. And we have to do that by recognizing that over the past 50, 60, 70 years, during the, the Cold War that was just referred to, the United States was hardly a paragon of freedom or democracy. I mean, I grew up during the Vietnam era um, when every civics lesson I learned in high school was shattered and stomped on by Lyndon Johnson and by Robert McNamara and by Richard Nixon who murdered an entire nation. I've spent a lot of time in Vietnam and I've seen it up close. Um, what about the coup d'etats and the reactionary um, dictators and fascists and, and authoritarians and murderers that we supported everywhere from the Shah to Guatemala to the Philippines, and I'm not talking about the current guy, but, but Marcos. I mean, the list of unspeakable crimes that the United States has endorsed and supported over the last 70 years and during winning this sparkling victory in the Cold War is, is something that we need to apologize for, be humble about, and to recognize that if we're gonna then go back into the world and try to deal with the world as it really is, we have to acknowledge the fact that we were brutal and cruel to many, many countries and peoples all around the world. Do you think Trump has any notion of any of that? He, do you think he knows the difference between Afghanistan and an aardvark? No. <laughs> he, so, so let's get real about what America needs to be and recognize that we've done some pretty terrible things, far from creating democracy in some of those countries like Iran, we overthrew a democratically elected leader, and we're still dealing with an Iran for which that's really front and center, and uh, we can talk about that in the questions, too. Good, thank you. Heather? So I wanna offer you guys a deal, which is you take Trump having a co coherent worldview this time, and I'm not gonna come back on that again. Um, I will say I think it's an enormous mistake that progressives really should have learned that running down your opponent is dumb is never a way to get anywhere. Um, I also, I wanna point out something that's sort of a subtext to all of these remarks. The thing that Trump identified and really, as I say, did very well in his own way is how much discomfort w there was, how much outdatedness there was with the role that the U.S. had been playing in the world since um, the end of World War II. And it's really, it makes me very sad that we can't have a conversation among the four of us about that without the looming specter of what we currently have in office, which, and I'm really grateful, Bob, that you reminded us of the origins of America first, because I never want to get to the place where we're just using that as a cutesy program title and not remembering what it refers to under the administration that has willfully winked at and consorted with and retweeted the people who brought you Charlottesville, where someone was killed, who brought you Pittsburgh, who brought you the shootings in black churches and other places, and who are willfully consorting with and part of a pan-national community that is routinely 
uh, toppling Jewish graves in France, that is young men running through the streets looking for people of color to target in Germany, and that it is shooting up mosques in New Zealand. That's who this administration has made America first. Not because... I have two other quick points. I'll spare all of you all. I will not say again, Henry, what I said in my opening remarks about where Russia has troops that it didn't have them in 2016 and the state of China's military forces that weren't as they are in 2016, but I really challenge the idea that somehow this president um, understands great power rivalry or is really actually implementing the Mattis. Whatever you think of the Mattis strategy, it's not being implemented. So I don't, I mean, it's nice you can claim that as a success if you want, but um, things on the ground don't really bear it out that way. And um, the idea that we've somehow restored um, moral, let alone strategic clarity in the Middle East by putting ourselves on the side of the Saudis in the Saudi-Iranian fight, the Saudis that not just dismembered a journalist in their consulate, but have overseen the willful deaths by starvation and malnutrition of tens of thousands of Yemenis as we supported them and resupplied them. That's not my kind of strategic and moral clarity, so I, I, really, I really challenge those. Thank you. Bob Kaufman. Bob. Uh, three points. Uh, one, Bob's dead wrong, and, but I, I really have ambivalence about saying this because um, his arrogance is going to be the reason that the Democrats lose again. When he says nobody thinks Trump has a coherent foreign policy, a lot of foreign policy experts, and I'm one of them, and Victor Davis Hanson is a real heavyweight, think that he does. There's a legitimate debate about that. Uh, two, Heather, um, I'm hoping that you're not insinuating that Trump is in any way associated with Charles Lindbergh's anti-Semitic version of America First, where Lindbergh gave a speech at Ames, Iowa that basically uh, took almost word for word Hitler's warning at the sports palace that if World War II began, uh, there would be a final solution. Um, if Trump is an anti-Semite, he's behaving very strangely, um, moving the capital to Jerusalem, recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Jord, uh, Golan Heights, and also giving a wonderful State of the Union that Abe Greenwald in commentary rightly called uh, the most pro-Jewish uh, speech uh, in American presidential history. And thirdly, um, as for us apologizing for our sins, uh, the search for the perfect is the enemy of the good. We've made mistakes. But as for America's role in the world, uh, we're the worst country except for any other. Without the United States, Kaiser Wilhelm would have won World War I, imposing some type of autocratic tyranny. Hitler would have won World War II. The Soviet Union would have won the Cold War. And the one thing Trump has done, I disagree, not really disagree, but uh, as a matter of emphasis, he's actually deepened our uh, commitment to East Asia, uh, responding very firmly, uh, backing the Japanese and the South Koreans, and also reviving a partnership with a decent democratic India that Obama let languish that I think is one of the most important strategic relationships in the world's most vital geopolitical region for the 21st century. So I repeat, we are indeed better off than we were when Trump took office in January of 2017. Really? Plus, we are now, thanks to him unleashing energy and restoring American prosperity, uh, capable of uh, behaving like a world power in a world way we were not during the slow, sluggish, self-induced Obama non-recovery. <laughs> All right. Uh, Henry, you will have. I, I should probably give up my time since I, <laughs> I, I'll just make one very quick point. I mean, Bob, and, uh, Bob Dreyfus and, and, and Heather, they make good points, but I think the difference between my view of things and their view of things is they focus on what turned out to be not that bad, but not that significant. I focus on the things that really work. We made mistakes in Vietnam. We made mistakes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But look at what has happened in the world over the last 75 years. Look at the tremendous 
successes we have had. Um, to, to worry about fascism in America because of Charlottesville, I think about America over the last 50 years in terms of the Civil Rights Revolution. I grew up in the South. I know the dramatic change that has taken place in this country. There's still plenty of racism, but my God, nothing like there was 50 years ago. So I see that shining city on the hill. I'm sorry, I was influenced too much by Ronald Reagan. With all of its warts, and, and I really think that's the difference. Uh, on just one final point, on the um, you know, question of whether uh, Ch China became, did a 180 degree turn and became belligerent on Obama's watch. And so it's, it has continued, of course, to expand. Uh, as Bob has said, I think we've laid, the, we've laid the gauntlet down for China. We've strengthened both the alliance with Japan and with South Korea. We've taken a tough stand with China on trade. We are asking China for cooperation on the North Korean uh, problem, uh, you know, probably without uh, a chance of too much success because China doesn't mind having North Korea annoy us. And I do think that we, well, the Russian, I mean, Russia's got its own objectives. And you bet they've increased their troops on the border of the Baltic states, but what have we done? And under Obama, that started in 2016, NATO agreed to put American, NATO forces, including American battalions, on the border of Russia for the first time since 1991. So if something happens in the Baltic states now, American forces are gonna be involved. That's the trigger to support our alliance. That's supporting the NATO. Trump has increased our expenditures to NATO, not decreased them. He's asking other countries to spend more on NATO, not less on NATO. Um, he is in fact, but he's doing it in an unorthodox style. And our problem is we can't get beyond that style for some <laughs> reason. Maybe it's political, it's a great, you know, Trump gives us a great target uh, in terms of his style. But I think if you get beyond that, you do see some sense in what he is doing in the foreign policy. Field. Henry, I'd like you to go to Vietnam and tell them that it was a mistake. I, 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 look, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division, almost went to Vietnam, but I came. Yeah, I was in the protest movement trying to stop yeah, that yeah, war. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what. Uh, I hey, as the baby on the panel, I'd like to actually suggest that we get beyond Vietnam, and either you can take questions or <laughs> I'll take a right of reply about Lindbergh, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, in the interest of moving on, I mean, I, had, I do have a few questions, but first of all, one of the audience members was very kind to make some suggestions for you, Bob Dreyfus, as to where to travel next. So I'm going to oh. pass on this index okay, card to you. <laughs> Lots of places for you to go to see. Uh, Professor Kaufman, uh, his comments have, uh, I'm sorry, have, uh, have okay, is allowed, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Uh, Professor Kaufman's comments have elicited a number of questions, and I'm going to take the liberty of combining some of these questions in the interest of moving on. One of the questions says that some time ago, uh, you, you said at this forum, at, at the work, I'm sorry, uh, you said that, mark my words, in 10 years time, in 10 years time, everyone in this room will know that our incursion into Iraq was, was a brilliant foreign policy initiative. Do you still believe in it? Uh, another question to you, uh, Professor Kaufman has to do with climate. Uh, is Trump a climate ch uh, change denial person even when his own military uh, says that there is a problem? Uh, so how would you respond to that, to these two questions? Yeah, I'll let Steve Hayward deal with the climate change stuff. Um, on Iraq, I think the great tragedy of the war, regardless of whether you supported it, is that we had won it and we withdrew prematurely, and the lesson of the 20th and 21st century is you have to stay the course, and we had succeeded. Even Joe Biden said that in 2009, and we can debate whether it was worth it, but the failure wasn't inevitable. Nevertheless, the failure, for whatever the reason, is water under the bridge, and I think the Trump administration has rightly refocused the primary energy of American foreign policy in rank order on East Asia and the Chinese threat, Putin number two, in Iran number three, and on those three fundamental things, I think Trump has it right and we're much better off because he does. Thank you. Uh, instead of singling out Professor Kaufman, uh, I'm gonna address this question to the entire panel, even though I think 
Bob Kaufman was the one who mentioned something about the coherence of the Trump. Uh, well, I, I usually get most of these, so thanks for giving <laughs> thanks so, for giving it to some other people. So yeah, I mean, any one of you would care to respond to this question from one of our students. How can one say that Donald Trump's foreign policy has been coherent? Uh, we withdrew from Syria while ramping up drone strike, uh, strikes in Somalia, and also we created terrorists uh, in Yemen by our policy, uh, overlooking flagrant foreign policy, uh, human rights violations in Palestine, Xinjiang, Libya, Russia. Uh, in effect, is our policy of America first exacerbating these problems? So. Yeah, well, I, w I, I could ask the same question. Just ahead. for fun, um, I, the, the items the questioner raised, all of which to me seem like important questions, but that's not the relevant angle. The relevant angle is how do you present a vision of power in the world that says I am here today and I can do whatever I want today. And that is, that is a pre-World War II um, sort of pre-United pre Nations, pre-League of Nations idea about how great powers work in the world and how power is best expressed. Um, and as I hope you can tell from my comments, I don't think that's a wise way to behave in a world with global supply chains, nuclear weapons, and the global problem of climate change. But it is very much a coherent thread that runs through the not always particularly coherent day-to-day -day policy choices. And I wanted to say a little bit about uh, Iran in this context. Um, he campaigned on withdrawing from the Iran agreement. Um, he was dissuaded from doing so by some people in the administration for about 18 months. And then he finally pulled out of this agreement, which was I would argue that the landmark diplomatic achievement, not only of the Obama administration, but of the other five world powers who signed on to that, which actually pushed back Iran's ability to get anywhere close to a nuclear weapon by somewhere between 10 and 20 years, depending on what you look at. So by withdrawing from that agreement um, and hiring a person like John Bolton, who has called for bombing Iran who's called for, you know, basically regime change there. Um, he's not only exacerbated problems in an extremely difficult part of the world where there are many, many flashpoints that could erupt into a U.S.-Iran conflict um, tomorrow morning, in fact. Um, but he's also made it almost impossible to imagine how the North Koreans would then trust the administration to make a deal on their existing real nuclear uh, uh, capability because we reneged on that agreement. Why would they possibly trust Trump? So, I mean, this kind of strategic incoherence, I would argue, is, is something that the, the rest of the world is simply marveling at and, and cannot, they're rubbing their eyes. They can't believe what they're watching. Yeah, Bob Dreyfus, you've done it again. No. You, you, you've claimed authoritativeness where, where it's absolutely false. Now, you may believe in the Iran deal. Uh, I've criticized it, but the idea that Trump is somehow an outlier, a uh, few other people oppose the Iran deal in public uh, with credentials better than all of ours. Henry Kissinger, George Shultz, there is a very, very serious argument that the Iran deal was fatally flawed. It's not in any way an indication of recklessness that um, people have huge doubts about the Iran deal that have uh, very impressive foreign policy credentials. So uh, when we treat Trump as an outlier that, oh, he's arguing the American interest, uh, he is in many ways, to amplify Henry's point, uh, it's unorthodox, uh, expressing things that have a deep tradition. And for those of you who think that Trump is incoherent, I think the greatest military historian of the past hundred years is a friend of mine named Victor Davis Hanson. I defy you not to take seriously Victor Davis Hanson's number two on the New York Times bestseller list, the case for Trump. You don't have to agree with it. But anybody who dismisses it without reading it 
uh, does so at their intellectual and political peril. We're uh, not all deplorables. Let, let me <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, I would let, like let me, to. Let me uh, retrieve a few minutes here since I seem to have uh, my photos um, been built up here lately. Um, let me just take the Middle East. Um, Obama had a strategy of pursuing detente with Iran in the hope that if he got an agreement with Iran on the nuclear program, Iran would moderate its behavior in the region. He deliberately ignored, while he was negotiating the agreement, the fact that Iran continued to increase its support for terrorism throughout the region. Iran, by the way, initiated the war in Yemen. It's blamed now on Saudi Arabia. It was started by the Iranians and their support of the Houthis. Uh, and um, the agreement was signed. We gave Iran $150 billion back in uh, reserves that we had uh, uh, sanctioned. And uh, uh, Iran has not stopped its aggression in the Middle East. It's accelerated it. So you can make a case that there ought to be another way to approach this. And this is what Trump did. The very first country he went to, foreign country, was Saudi Arabia. Because he has another way of thinking about <laughs> how to get Iran uh, how to deal with the Iran issue, and that is to build a countervailing coalition against Iran in the region to push back against Iran hegemony, to try to persuade the Saudis and other Arab states and Turkey uh, to put boots on the ground in uh, eastern Syria and in western Iran to try to now make sure that ISIS doesn't come back uh, and that we can hold that territory and to break up this supply of um, military equipment and weapons that are going from Iran to Jordan and to Lebanon and to uh, the, uh, to the um, Gaza Strip. Um, and um, I, I think that's worth a try. Now, he's not going to throw it all away because of the Khashoggi um, incident. I think he's smart not to do that. At times, you need to kind of persist in working with some groups like the Saudis, who are not by any means perfect. But nevertheless, they're your only possibility for mm. constructing a countervailing uh, alliance in the region that will take some of the pressure off of Israel. Because if we don't, we're going to get another war in the Middle East. That's where we were heading under Obama, with Iran continuing, now with the agreement in hand, uh, continuing to increase its aggression in the region. Um, in, in, in Europe and in Asia, I don't, to me, it's what he has done, not what he has said and how he has said it. But what he has done is very coherent. He's strengthening the alliance. He's supporting the presence of American forces on the borders of Russia. He's supporting Kiev in giving them lethal weapons to make the cost of any further aggression by Russia in Ukraine more, uh, more severe. Um, he has um, strengthened our alliances in Asia, as Bob mentioned, with Japan and South Korea. Very delicate situation out there that he's dealing with, because the Japanese and the South Koreans don't get along. Uh, and yet we're going to need both of them if, there, if there's ever a conflict on the Korean Peninsula. And he's got the North Koreans involved in some discussions now with no results, but those discussions still, still seem to be uh, uh, ongoing. I think you can make uh, a coherent sort of picture out of that. And, and I'm you know, pleading that we sort of get beyond trying to find some um, image of an American president who uh, goes around the world, gets liked by everybody, but doesn't really uh, take effective actions that, uh, that, that have uh, results. I'm sorry, I'm gonna jump back in here, because <laughs> okay. first, um, I mean, our alliance with South Korea is in tatters, in part because the president has continued to jam them and jam them and jam them to spend more money. As you know perfectly well, Henry, I'm sure, um, he has refused to renegotiate a multi-year basing agreement with them, pushed back on them repeatedly. Uh, the Japanese are, are in, in, in a fit because of Trump's coziness with North Korea, who, as you note, the Japanese don't get along with as they don't get along with the South Koreans. Iran has not moderated its support for terrorist groups in the region under Trump any more than it didn't moderate it under Obama. Israel is under more pressure from Gaza and Lebanon and Syria than it was in 2016. That has only moved in one direction. Um, and Russia has not moved back at all in Ukraine, despite the provision of, legal wep of lethal weapons. So there's just no place you can point, you can say, okay, this is a different strategy, it's worth a try, but there's no place you can point to where it's working. 
I, I want to also say, by the way, l let's talk about Israel and Saudi Arabia for a second, and let's get real. Israel is not the, the Israel of the 1950s and socialism in the kibbutzes. Israel is a nation run by an extremist administration that has just allied yeah. itself with terrorist yeah. Jewish parties in this current election, which happens next week. Today, um, today. today sorry. Today. Um, I forgot time zone differences here. Uh, <laughs> that, so this is a, an Israeli leader who has openly since 2012 allied with the Republican Party against the Democratic Party and explicitly fought to, um, okay, that's the Israel part. Then the Saudi part, this is a, an ultra-reactionary regime which, unlike Iran, has no elections, has no freedom for any of its people. The Israelis and the Saudis have been cooperating covertly for many years, but now overtly in an alliance of ultra-reactionaries. The, the, it's not the job of the United States to go into that part of the region and build an alliance against Iran, which by the way, I've been to Iran a number of times. I know the situation there. They're surrounded by American troops in Iraq, in the Gulf, with the Navy, in Afghanistan. They feel very paranoid about having American troops surrounding them in every direction with an administration that's calling for regime change. That's pretty scary for the Iranians. So, so there's nothing sacred or holy about the Israeli-Saudi alliance against Iran. It's a very complicated problem but one on which Trump has no competent understanding and has simply thrown in his lot with Jared Kushner and, and people who have no clue about how that part of the world works. What would CWA let, me, let me try to get some questions from the audience. What would CWA be without the ritual denunciation of a decent democratic Israel while ignoring the tyrannies that seek to eradicate it? I feel I'm at home. So let me get to... Uh, I'll try to combine some questions from the audience, and there are two questions that I'm going to try to ask, okay? And you, the panelists, can decide which ones you want to respond to. How does America First policy relate to the current danger facing humankind, global warming? That's one question, too. Does it make any sense uh, to have a nationalist policy in this context of global menace, global climate change? Number two, uh, the order-based international system has served democracies well thus far. Why are we doing the job of Vladimir Putin in destroying it? Specifically, an ex as an example, what's the rationale for scrapping the Iran nuclear deal? Would that advance the goal of nuclear non-proliferation? Why, for example, North Korea should believe in the words of the United States? So, two baskets. Go ahead. Any, any of you want to respond well, to either I, one I, of these two I questions? I don't think, I mean, the Iran agreement has not ended the Iranian nuclear program. It's put some constraints on it, and there are already, you know, charges at least that some uh, uh, of the provisions of the agreement have been violated. Uh, inspectors not, not were true, recently. Not true. I'm sorry? Not true. Not one provision has been slightly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the International the Atomic the Energy a Agency, the Israeli intelligence, and U.S. intelligence have all said that it's still being. Kept. Let's do some fact yeah. checking here. There's not the Iranians have not violated the inspectors one. Inspectors for the first time Iota. have try have asked for permission to test some of the uh, you know air samples and ground samples uh, in a in a in a nuclear site in Iran. They were delayed, and they have been delayed for the last couple of months. You can be sure that site is being cleaned up. We've never examined a site directly. There was only one other time when we requested a test, and then we let the Iranians carry it out and send it to us in uh, a video. I mean, look. It, None of that is true. The, None just, of that just, is true just, at all. Just, just a minute. Okay. No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to let you sit up well, here. Well, Bob, I'm not going to let you and, dominate and, and the do discussion falsehoods. either. All right, I'm not finished yet. You're stating and falsehoods. And I think that I think that in the case of uh, you know, um, of Iran, I mean, we're, we're, there's a good chance. I mean, Iran hasn't, do, hasn't changed anything as a result of the nuclear agreement because they haven't given up anything. Uh, they can go back to a full nuclear program in 15 years if they want to. Uh, and in some areas, they can go back sooner. Um, so don't make too much about that agreement. And the most important thing is stability in the region that prevents another war. 
uh, with Israel because we're going to get drawn into that war one way or another. Uh, and I think Trump has got the right instincts. He doesn't want to get us involved in a big war in that region. That's why he's trying to put this coalition together. He's trying not to put large American forces in Syria. He's very reluctant to use force in these circumstances. I think that's appropriate, especially in these regions that are remote from sort of the central battleground for freedom, which is in Europe and on the Korean Peninsula. So yeah, there's a pattern there. I'm sorry, there's a strategy there, and it doesn't do any good to simply you know, call, I never, it wouldn't do me any good to say that Obama was clueless on all this. What difference does that make? Let's look at what they did and compare and contrast what they did. That's where the argument is for strategy and for a, 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 you know, a useful foreign policy debate. Uh, to emphasize what Henry said, three things about the Iran deal that a lot of people believe, uh, contrary to what Bob Dreyfus said, many with very good credentials. One, even if the Iranians abided by the provisions, it didn't restrict uh, much what they were going to be able to achieve uh, breaking out with a nuclear capability. Two, it's unverifiable because it depends on Iranian compliance to let us inspect. The inspecting provisions aren't mandatory. And three, even in the rare event that we detect violations, uh, the so-called snapback provisions requires the assent of the Security Council where Russia and China would exercise a veto. And four, the treaty did not cover, and it was a huge omission, the Iranian ballistic missile program. So a lot of very, very shrewd people, and you don't have to agree with them, have made a very serious case, and Trump reflects that case, that the Iran deal is more harmful than helpful to the alternative strategy that Henry laid out of creating a regional pro-American coalition to constrain and contain an Iranian regime that seeks to dominate it to the uh, extent and uh, in violation of our interests and those of our most important allies. Again, you don't have to agree with it, reasonable people can disagree, but to present Trump as presumptively beyond the pale, taking these positions that Henry Kissinger and George Shultz have endorsed is not furthering uh, debate and deliberation by reason and choice. What so about three climate points, change? Three points, yeah, and one of them will be climate change. Um, it is worthy of note that Kissinger and Schultz did not support leaving the Iran deal. Uh, it is a wonderful irony for those of you who like to consume irony that the very most ambitious deals that have been floated as possible outcomes of this sortie with North Korea which has involved some truly stomach-churning um, declarations of friendship with that murderous man. Um, but the really, so realpolitik, fine, hug dictators, what are you gonna get me out of it? What you're gonna get me out of it is not even as good, not even as strong, not even as verifiable as the Iran deal with a country that already has full-blown nuclear warheads, unlike Iran. And finally, on climate change, this, this isn't really my place, uh, but since neither of my colleagues wanted to talk about it, um, it's really, so the majority of Republicans are not climate deniers. They understand perfectly well that climate is changing. Again, to my broader point and Bob's point, people aren't stupid. But there is not, there's number one, not an, it's just the idea of transnational sort of partnerships that transcend whatever my national interest is at any particular moment is not part of the paradigm. The idea of binding yourself to anything other than the Constitution is explicitly rejected in the paradigm. And so, and the idea of doing anything that disables U.S. energy companies and um, diminishes the role of U.S. fossil fuel reserves is seen as a weakness rather than a strength. So why would you do any of that? So the whole construct of combating climate change the way we have it is just, I mean, there, the, it hasn't been brought up because it, it bounces off this worldview. It, it doesn't exist for this worldview except something silly that liberals say. So let me try to get one more question in, <laughs> uh, combining questions from the audience. Again, the question has been asked, do you believe that the invasion of Iraq was the correct decision? Would you do it again? Uh, specifically, Professor Kaufman. Uh, but the rest of the panel can also respond to this question. And what would you do about Venezuela? Would you promote or endorse a policy of intervention to remove Maduro? Well, I hate to revisit Iraq again, but it's a, it's a subject that I spent many years between 2001 
and 2008, intensively reporting from Washington, um, going to countless briefings from neoconservatives, discussing people with, with people in the intelligence community and the State Department. Um, it was an unbelievably catastrophic thing to do to move into Iraq. I, I, hesit I cannot call it a mistake because a lot of people want to call it a mistake. The head of the UN called it criminal, illegal. Um, a million people probably have died in Iraq in the past 17 years. Its industry was shattered. Its, its coherence was smashed to pieces so that Kurds and Shiites and Sunnis um, are now separated into their corners. How many people, you remember the deck of cards when we invaded Iraq? And there was 52. And, w and people said that this was this Sunni dictatorship. How many people th think that there were like 10 Shiites in that deck? How many people think there were 20 Shiites? In the, you know how many? There were 36 Shiites in the 52 card deck that the US military handed out. One third of Iraqi Shiites, Sunnis, and Kurds were intermarried with each other in 2003. So we broke a nation apart. We utterly destroyed it. We ravaged the, reason, the region. We set off parallel crises in several other countries bordering Iraq. We scared the Iranians into their corner, which has not worked out well in the past 15 years. There's to, to uh, it, it shocks me that anyone in you know 2019, looking back, could defend well, the invasion me, of Iraq. Well, let me shock you. Yeah, no, I've heard. Let me shock you because uh, you have ignored Saddam Hussein and the nature of his regime. And whatever you think of the war, and I think reasonable people could say on cost-benefit analysis, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But the great tragedy of Iraq is that after Davis Petraeus' surge, we had won it, and we snatched defeat from the jaws of victory, and um, that's my position to the questioner, and that's been my position throughout. Yeah, my, uh, look, I mean, um, I think the mistake, I, at the time, you can understand the decision on Iraq. We were very scared. You were very scared. Don't say that you weren't, because you were. The American people were very scared in the period of 2001, 2002. We didn't know what the dimension of this terrorist threat that had hit us on 9-11 was. And so you can understand it. Remember the congressional vote in the fall of 2002. Go back and see who voted for that. That was an overwhelming approval by the American Congress, your representatives, that we should use force if necessary in Iraq. So I don't know that the decision to do the invasion was wrong. I think we made mistakes in not having a quick way of getting out of the country once we were there. We thought we should try to build a democracy the way we did in Germany and Japan. I mean, that's uh, a bridge too far in a country or in a region like uh, the Middle East. Uh, and so I can fault us there. I think that's you know, what Trump is trying to avoid, what Obama before him was trying to avoid. Let's don't do that again. If we have to go in to get the terrorists, let's do that, but then let's come out as quickly as possible in these regions. Let's stick it out, by the way, in Europe and in Asia, where there's a lot more at stake in terms of the future of freedom in both of those regions. Our position in those parts of the world, I think, is much more uh, Im important. On climate change, uh, no need to avoid this. I don't think any Republican wants to avoid it. It is a problem. We should be addressing it. We are addressing it. The market is doing more. The marketplace is doing more right now, all right, to reduce some emissions in the United States and other advanced uh, industrial countries than anything else. Even if we do more, throw everything at this problem and ignore, therefore, other problems, because you don't have unlimited resources, uh, the question is whether or not, in fact, you're going to um, uh, you're going to achieve uh, what you hope to achieve. And uh, the likelihood is that you're not, and this is going to be a very expensive diversion. Uh, you're not going to be able to get, well, if you want it to succeed, you've got to get China and India to agree. And that's a big problem nobody's addressing. It's as if it's our problem alone. It's not. We could do, the, we could do 10 times more. And if we had the resources and we didn't have other problems, I might even approve of that. I don't want to do that now because I don't think it's a problem that ranks uh, that high. 
that I should throw everything at it and leave everything else go. But somehow I'm still left with the problem of what to do with China and India. Thank you. So, um, if I may. Yes, I quickly, because uh, I think I've got to right. stick no times out. Um, I was against Iraq in 2002. Haven't changed my mind. Uh, Maduro, who no one else addressed, needs to go. It's a catastrophe if either he is actually taken out by the U.S. military or if he is perceived to have been taken out by the U.S. military or U.S. intelligence. And last, you asked me a while back if I was insinuating that the president was um, connected to white nationalists. No, I'm not insinuating it. I'm saying explicitly that this <laughs> president gives aid and comfort to white nationalists with consequences that we're gonna be paying for in domestic and foreign policy, both for a long time. And those of us who are Jewish or of color or Muslim or gay or disabled may be paying for with our lives. Disagree. Thank you. We'll continue the conversation after the panel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.